all that leaves me now is to introduce our first uh, reader, Philip Hoare. Um, I'm delighted that Philip is the person who is beginning the day because he is, uh, I think, a, a pioneer of finding, of allowing a work to find its form. Um, his works, Leviathan, The Sea Inside, um, are, I think, they, they transcend category and genre and encourage those of us who read them to, to allow our work to find its own shape too. Um, so Philip is going to talk for about 40 minutes and then he and I will have a short conversation and then I will invite you to ask questions. So please join me in welcoming Philip Hall. Almost a hundred years ago, when my grandfather came back from the First World War, which he'd served in India, he built a house for himself and my grandmother. I never saw this house. I never knew my grandfather. He died long before I was born. But in this house, he was a very good builder. It was a house, a modest house in the suburbs of Southampton, the city in which I was born and brought up and where I still live. In the bathroom, there was a wonderful Victorian roll-top bath, splendid bath. And along the side of this bath, my grandfather painted the shape of a spouting whale. That image, as I say, I never saw that bath. I never met my grandparents. I was never witness to that great spouting whale. But that image stayed with me. And it still does. It haunts me in a way because it embodies the shape of the whale, which is something that has obsessed me now for maybe all my life, but very specifically from a writing point of view for the past 15 years. And it's kind of odd because the association of the whale with the bath, with the water, with the port city in which I was born, inculcated an extraordinary fear, a fear which is still with me, a fear of deep water, um, to the extent that actually I didn't even like taking a bath. <laughs> I took a bath this morning, I will hasten to add, but uh, um, so a, a, a deep fear which, you know, is, is not irrational. Uh, last year, I was walking along the south bank of the Thames with my young nieces and nephews. We'd been on a wander around the city. And it was a high, swelling flood tide, and the waters of the Thames were flowing like cappuccino, flowing back out to the North Sea. And it was a surging mass of water right next to us. And there was plenty of tourists around. It was a bright, sunny day. We were all happy. All it needed was for me, or my young nephews, or young nieces, to take one step, and there would be nothing that 21st century technology, one of the world's greatest cities, nothing that could be done to save our lives. We'd be carried away down to the German Ocean, as it used to be known, and that would be the end of us. <laughs> Happy stuff, isn't it? Um, <laughs> And it's that notion that the water threatens us with mortality as well as giving us life. The fact that Arthur C. Clarke famously said that we shouldn't call it the planet Earth, we should call it the planet Ocean because so much of its surface is covered by water. When you think of the three-dimensional mass of water versus the two-dimensional sliver, the carapace of land which we occupy, how arrogant, how, how foolish we are to think that we are sort of masters of the world when there is this great volume, this alien universe that occupies the rest of the world. If you imagine the water, yes, covers three quarters of the world's surface, but then also imagine the depth of it, down to the Mariana Trench, 11 miles in depth, 
the sheer cubic volume of that environment, the fact that 90% of all life on Earth resides in the sea, beneath what Herman Melville called the ocean's skin, this liminal membrane, this fragile dividing part between us and it. And really, that's just a barrier. That's a, just a barrier of, of solid gas, really. The ocean itself doesn't even have a color. This is a photograph I took um, early last year in the Atlantic Ocean off Stellwagen Bank off, the, off Cape Cod in, in New England. And looking down into that very, very deep water, all you see is yourself. There's the shadow of me there. Can't quite see me, but a bit light. But um, and Melville, again, in the, f in, the, in the opening chapter of Moby Dick, talks about the way we are ineffably drawn towards the water. We are all water gazers, as he calls us. Uh, he talks about the citizens of New York wandering down to that noble mole, the battery, to stand and just look out at the sea. And what Melville's saying is, is we're looking at ourselves. It's almost like Narcissus. We're looking into our souls. Um, and in many ways, Melville has been the guide for me, my, my kind of spirit guide, my familiar, um, my main man for the journey I've been on for the past 15 years. But also, I've tried to engage with the water because I felt this terrible fear I had. You know, when I was at swimming school, at les at lessons at we used to go to swimming on every Wednesday afternoon in the local municipal baths in Southampton, this 1950s building, sort of concrete with a blue roof. And the sight of even that blue roof induced terror in me even before I got to the building. Once the doors opened, there was that s invasive smell of chlorine and fog and boys entering puberty. It was just terrifying. And the most terrifying thing of all, that they, someone thought it was funny to put, have a big, great big porthole at the bottom of the pool so that when you walked in, you saw people pressing their faces against the window or, or their asses. And I thought, my God, you know, this is just a torture chamber. And then you're made to undress and, you know, there's all these boys around you sprouting hair where you never thought hair could possibly sprout. And you're into the pool into the torture chamber itself, where my P master, my games master, was a former army sergeant major. And his, his form of, of, of teaching us to swim was literally to push us in. Um, all I had to guard myself was this crumbling polystyrene float, which I gripped on with my fingernails digging into the crumbling polystyrene and trying to launch myself across the pool for all these brave boys with their little red and green flags on their trunks indicating they could swim a width or swim a length. That was, uh, that might as well have been the Victoria Cross or the Légion d'honneur to me. Um, and you know, the idea of immersing yourself in that water where down on the bottom of that mockingly blue tiled bottom with sticking plasters and hair and other sorts of things. Uh, why on earth would anyone want to do that? I just didn't understand it. So, but you know, uh, uh, it, it was a real handicap for me throughout all, all of my teenage years. When we used to go to the beach, I always just pretend I had a cold or something, you know, a fun, some way of, of opting out. So it wasn't until actually when I was a grown man, I was 25 years old and I was living in, in East London, very far from the sea, um, unemployed, I'd been working in the music business, but now I was unemployed, and, uh, and I felt I had to challenge my, my fear. And so I went to uh, one of these wonderful Victorian swimming baths in, 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 in Bethnal Green, wonderful sort of beautifully tiled and very, very ornate. And I tried to teach myself to swim, and uh, 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 it was inept, as one might imagine. But swimming gracefully up and down the pool was a lady who must have been 70, maybe even 80. I think she was probably nearer 80 years old. And she had a swimming costume, which I swear was boned. I think there must have been whalebone in it, actually. <laughs> and one of those rubber hats with daisies on it. 
And she looked fantastic. She was like Esther Williams, if anyone knows who I mean. And she took pity on me. She saw that I was a poor, pathetic, flailing weakling in the shallow end. And she, she taught me in a very gentle way how to make friends with the water, or rather, how to agree a truce. Because you are never friends with the water. Um, it is always potentially your enemy. But in the confines of an urban pool, OK, I sort of got used to it. She, I even got to put my face in the water. And that, that was the key, really. That was the first thing that made me realize, ah, OK, so this thing can support you. This, can, this water can buoy you up. Um, Baudelaire wrote about swimming as being the sensation of a thousand kisses. Um, Swinburne felt orgasmic ecstasies when he threw himself into the waves off the Isle of Wight. Um, so I saw this sort of precedent for what I was missing. And so I learned to swim. And I swim every day now. I'm very angsty today because I haven't swum today. I swam yesterday at 6 o'clock at dawn, well, actually before dawn, in, in the English Channel. Uh, I've just spent three weeks in Cape Cod swimming every day in the Atlantic, which was very cold. Um, but on none of those occasions, and I do swim, you know, when there's snow on the beach, uh, you know, the, it's pitch dark. Um, on no occasion do I enter the water and I am not shit scared. Absolutely scared because of what might be in it. And what might be in it is kind of what's in your head, obviously, but there are other precedents for, for the notion of what the water might contain. And allied to my strange watery journey is a love of and a fear of the animals in the water, in the sea. But most specifically, one animal. And one animal because it's that animal that my grandfather painted on the bath. It's the animal which more than any other living creature, other than Homo sapiens, represents the dysfunctional relationship between human history and natural history, and represents a cultural clash, a clash which is more extreme as it proceeds in a way, and uh, more urgent too. Excuse me. And it's, to me, incorporated in the shape of that animal and, and, and what, it, what, it, what it represents. Which is, of course, the whale. The whale is a great shape shifter. It changes with the decades, with the centuries, with the millennia. In the Quran, it's one of the animals which will enter heaven. In the Bible, it's the animal which swallowed Jonah. In Free Willy, it's the animal that leaps over the fence and out to freedom. Uh, and, and with it, you know, all our hopes and fears and, and our childish dreams. But there's also something quite eldritch, quite eerie, quite uncanny about the whale because of what it bears on its broad, blubbery back, um, what it bears in its history, in its witness to our history, in the comparative timelines and narratives that we, as a race, as a species, occupy along the same time layer line of these animals and the way that they change in relationship to our culture. And that's what really fascinates me for many reasons. And I'm just going to show you a few images now just to sort of illustrate that. This is an illustration from Rockwell Kent's uh, illustrated edition of, of Moby Dick from 1930. And I really suppose it's the way we all did draw when we were kids, you know, a little smiley face and a spout and a little eye. But if you look back to where the whale came from, um, it's a much weirder beast. Uh, and this is a, 
a 16th century illustration. And it portrays the whale as a kind of cross between uh, a, a snorting pig uh, and a kind of dragon with these strange double plumes of spouts and these overhanging jaw and, and boar-like teeth. But the strange thing about this illustration is that the, it, within its fantastical representation of a beast which clearly the artist never saw, in the same way Abak Dura never saw a rhinoceros, um, are actually the seeds of the scientific whale that sort of we will tease out of the natural world. So balena is a word we recognize in relationship to the whale. It's used still. And that smaller whale down at the side there, orca, is bearing the name that we still give to the, to the killer whale. So you can see there's a kind of movement even now towards a classification of these animals to creating the, the animals which are living at the edge of the map. You know, the, note, the notion of the um, here, be, here be monsters, here be dragons, this sense of out in the wild ocean, there are dragons. Um, but of course that does change as you move through history, and this is a, a, a late 17th century illustration. Um, and you see these bizarre creatures now starting to take shape. And it's the, the top fish, a pot fish or a cachalot. It looks like an overgrown tadpole. And then a fin fish, and below that, um, it's probably a, a bowhead whale. These are, wh these are whales, three species, which would have been familiar to Europeans um, uh, because, of course, they were entering a new period of exchange with human beings in that they were being hunted um, from Germany, from Holland, from England, from Spain, um, and later on from America. Um, so the, the contrast is the notion of these animals as part of an economic chain now, but yet still unknown. They're still not really recognizable as animals, so no one can really still paint them. Uh, in any accurate way. By the end of the ninth, 18th century, things start to come into focus as so though the way this sort of gradually someone's pulling in the, the focus ring on these animals and trying to bring some kind of bearing, some real sense of, of, of what they physically represent. And so we have these two images of sperm whales a uh, particular species of, of toothed whale, uh, which is the whale that uh, Moby Dick is based on. Um, around the time that this image was made, the French Academy declared there were 14 different species of sperm whale. Well, there's only one. Uh, but here you see, this illustrates two entirely different types of sperm whales. You know, it's rather strange, smiling, blubbery thing down the bottom and that spouty thing at the top. I mean, they're illustrating the same animal. This is a, a real indication of the way that we were so disassociated from these animals. We only ever saw them, if we did see them at all, as bloated animals stranded on a shore, uh, turned into great sort of over-pumped up bicycle tires by the body gases decaying within their bellies. They had no absolutely no semblance of resemblance to their true hydrodynamic, sleek beauty in the water. In fact, that's really a very recent thing for us to know what whales look like. Um, we knew what the, whale look, the world looked like from outer space before we knew what, like a, what a whale looked like underwater. Uh, people knew what the Earth looked like from the Apollo missions before Henry had actually filmed a whale underwater. So it was taking a very long time for people to make up their minds what these creatures were. And um, it wasn't until the 1830s that courtesy of the whaling operations, especially of Britain and America, um, that a true representation of these animals started to appear. And that was through one man, Thomas Beale, who was a British surgeon who was stationed on a whaling ship, every whaling ship, especially a British whaling ship, had to have uh, an onboard surgeon. 
And Beale became fascinated by the absence of accurate record of these animals, of, 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 of anyone who'd actually really accurately uh, 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 depicted them or even described them. It seemed as though, and almost through the shame of whaling, that people felt they didn't want to explore what these animals were because they didn't want to find out what they were. Um, it's very much the undertow of Moby Dick, really, in a way. And it's key because this illustration from Beale's book, which was published, The Natural History of the Sperm Whale, published in 1835, was acclaimed by Melville as the only, absolutely the only accurate illustration of, of a sperm whale. And even then, it's, it's slightly caricatured, and it's not really quite, quite like a, a sperm whale looks like, but it's, it's as near as. But as we go through the century, of course, science takes over and these animals are classified. They come out of the Wunderkammer and they go into the proper museum. They become part of a post-enlightenment scientific discourse. And so in the hallway of the Natural History Museum, which uh, now holds a Diplodocus, many of you will have seen it. Uh, the Diplodocus, it was announced yesterday, is actually being taken away and is being replaced by the skeleton of a sperm whale, um, which is, uh, sorry, by the skeleton of a blue whale, um, whose antecedent here in the Victorian period was a sperm whale, as you can see. Skeleton um, sweetly misspelt there. Um, and and um, guarded by a Victorian policeman. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe they thought he would escape. Maybe he was going to make a run for it down to the Thames and swim back down, back to the German Ocean. Um, and then it changes again. In the 1940s, we have the Nazi whale, which is an animation by Disney in a propaganda film made by Frank Capra. It's a wonderful thing. As you can see this on YouTube, if you Google Battle of Britain, Frank Capra, have a look at this animation. It's fantastic because the whole of Europe turns into a sperm whale, biting plucky Britain. Um, but how interesting. I mean, you could not do that nowadays. Well, for many reasons why you couldn't do it nowadays. But one reason why you couldn't do it nowadays is because of what the whale now means to us. In just that short amount of time, how quickly that's changed. At the time this cartoon was made, my mum was serving whale for lunch. You know, whale was being eaten. The Natural History Museum, when a dolphin swam up the Thames, they harpooned and killed it and served it to journalists as an example of necessary protein, you know, in times of war, we will eat dolphins. Imagine if anyone did that nowadays. It's extraordinary. Um, and then it shifts again. This is a great, rather obscure image from a propaganda uh, 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 postcard produced during the Falklands War, that extraordinary imperialist... Uh, venture that Britain decides to uh, undertake in the 1980s. And what's interesting about this image is it's using one of those early 18th century images um, transposed to the Falklands Islands, supposedly, with the, the, uh, the caption says, rejoice. It's obviously ironic comment on, 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 on this misguided venture down in the South Atlantic. But also it's a reference to the fact that the Falkland Islands were a whaling station up until the uh, early 20th century. And of course, the reason why Britain was partly so interested in keeping the Falklands Island was for a new kind of oil, uh, mineral oil, um, which uh, could be um, mined there so, or, 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 or sourced there. So the whale is changing again. But I want to leap forward to, uh, uh, well, in a way back, uh, to another relationship with the whale, which comes out of that, um, that historical process and into my own, my own experience, and which is kind of the root of why I have been so obsessed with these animals and why I write about them now. And it comes uh, in a place called Windsor Safari Park which um, is now called Legoland, uh, for any of you who've been to it, um, outside London. And 
When we were children, myself and my two young sisters, we became obsessed with whales and dolphins. In retrospect, I realized we were the sort of subjects of a, a greater sort of cultural change that was going on over our heads that we weren't really quite aware of in suburban Southampton, but it was permeating down to our little pudding bowl haircut heads in Southampton. And, and we, we demanded that our parents take us to Windsor Safari Park to see the dolphins. And I remember that day very well. We drove up there in our big old family car and got to the dolphinarium and sat at the front row very eagerly awaiting the show. And it began. And into the pool swam the dolphins, joyfully leaping in to the water. And then they started their routine, jumping through a hoop, balancing a ball on their nose and catching fish in their beaks. And I started to feel uncomfortable with this because I realized this isn't what I really wanted. This isn't what I was expecting. I don't know what I was expecting, but this wasn't anything like the sort of pictures I'd seen on the Jacques Cousteau programs or in my child's encyclopedias. These were captives. You know, they were, they were in a prison. They were in something not much better than that swimming pool I swam in in Southampton, or rather didn't swim in. Um, and I definitely felt very uncomfortable. But then the whole dynamic of that encounter changed because the pool was cleared of these leaping inhabitants and a big black gate opened up at the other end. And in swam Ramu, our other performer, an orca, a killer whale, the apex predator, the most successful animal in the world's oceans, present in every ocean, in fact. Incredibly social, incredibly organized, incredibly intelligent. A wild, proud swimming animal with the tallest dorsal fin of any of the cetaceans, two meters high, scything through the seas of the Arctic or the Indian or the Atlantic Ocean, a signifier of this sea wolf, this extraordinary animal. But Ramu, our other performer, his dorsal fin had flopped like a detumescent sign of his captivity. A pathetic signal, really, of the whole scenario that was being presented to us, the circus that we were being presented with. And then, of course, inevitably, Ramu jumped through a hoop, balanced a ball on his nose, and caught fish in his beak. That was my moment of apostasy. That was when I grew up. That was when I realized how shit the world was. And that's when I fell out of love with these animals because I couldn't do anything about it. It was beyond my control. This was horrible. I couldn't deal with it. And so I shut down. That was it. So, fast forward, nearly 40 years almost, 30 years certainly, Cape Cod, the year 2000, and I've gone there to visit a friend, a um, friend called John Waters, he's a filmmaker, he summers in, in a place called Provincetown. And for any of you who haven't been to Cape Cod, don't know where it is, it's a great, it's a great sandy arm held out from the coast of New England. You've got Boston down here, and then this great sandy peninsula curling round to a fist. And at the very fingertips of the fist, these sandy, slender beaches, is a place called Provincetown. And during the great days of Yankee whaling, Provincetown was one of the great whaling ports, one of the richest places in America because of its trade in whale oil. But now, unbeknownst to me, it was one of the great places to go whale watching. I knew nothing about this. I was, I'd spent two weeks in Provincetown. I was going back to England. I was waiting on the pier for the ferry to take me back to Logan Airport uh, in Boston. And the ferry wasn't due for a while, for a few hours, in fact. And I saw a, 
uh, a placard on, on, on the wharf side there advertising whale watching. And, you know, I thought, oh, I'm not going to go there, you know. It, they, brought, they probably trained the whales with fish or something, you know. Um, being America, you know, I thought it's just, you know, whatever. Um, nonetheless, you know, uh, my curiosity had the better of me and I paid my $12 and I boarded the boat and stood at the prow and rather sort of defiantly folded my arms saying, okay, show me what you've got. <laughs> and half an hour later, out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a 40-ton, 40 40-foot 40 humpback whale breached from the water, leaving its environment, launching itself into our world, this extraordinary barnacled angel. No animal has ever de deserved its Latin binomial so well. The humpback whale, Megaptera novo, novo angliae, big-winged New Englander. And it hung there in a spray of diamond-like salt water, as though someone had put the pause button on the video. And it was so extraordinary. And I, being such a practiced writer, responded in a very, very eloquent way. I said, fuck. <laughs> because there are no words. How do you describe a mass of living flesh like that? just there, right there. It's like kind of flashing at you, this extraordinary creature, demonstrating both its kinship to us, but also that extraordinary distance. It was maybe 20 foot away from me, but it might have only been 20 miles. That sense of trying to close that distance has become my obsession now for the past 15 years. So I kept going back to Provincetown. I'd go on one whale watch a day, two whale watches a day, three whale watches a day. It was like a crack habit for me. Um, I'd stay on the boat all day. The captains would start looking at me really strangely. Who's this weird limey with all these weird questions and taking the photographs all the time. John Waters, when I showed him my photographs like this, he said, that's just whale porn. Um, he accused me of being a whale stalker. And I think for the sake of my sanity, he said, you've got to do something about this. <laughs> he was worried. And I think as an act of therapy, he recommended, do what, you know, what you're good at, write about it. I had no idea, I'm not a scientist. How do you write about animals? There are no words for these animals. There are no words for them. All the superlatives quickly run out like sand through your fingers. There are no words for these animals. It's, it's hopeless writing about them. I've tried for 15 years, it's hopeless. It's useless. And especially in the vanguard of Moby Dick, and any of you who haven't read that book, you don't even have to read it because Will Self and many other people will read it for you. MobyDickBigRead.com, go online, it's a free download and you, the book will be read for you in Will's mellifluous tones and, and many other people's, from Tilda Swinton to John Waters to Stephen Fry and Benedict Cumberbatch. How, how do you write about whales after Moby Dick? It's, that's not possible. All I could do was try and just follow my nose, really. Um, and really, I suppose I spent the last 15 years just chasing these animals around the planet. Um, and they have become, I have become intimate with them, but I have become much more distant from them at the same time. The more I know about them, the less I know about them. Herman Melville said, I know him not, and I never will. And that was after 136 chapters. <laughs> uh, so if he didn't know any, what he was talking about, you know, ha what, 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 what hope was there for me? I just really collected them in a way, like people used to collect bubblegum cards. Um, I just collected the experiences, hoping that the accumulation of these experiences, of these, these acts of communion, sometimes with these animals, um, sometimes acts of despair. There's nothing more frustrating than going to see a whale. As, Three times I took a BBC film crew across the Atlantic to see whales. We didn't see any whales. 
I wasn't very popular. Um, uh, they, they, they call the shots. They decide when they're going to be seen. And it's very interesting, isn't it? This photograph here, which is of one of my favorite individual whales. She's a whale called Anka. I know she's a female because she has this sort of bump underneath her tail, which is her, uh, her genital region. Um, not to be indiscreet, but um, the whales of the humpback whales are, are, of, of, of Cape Cod are intensely well studied. They're probably the most well studied whales in the world, partly because the undersides of those flukes, the tails, have this black and white pattern on them, which is as unique to each animal as human fingerprints are to a human being. So they can be photographed and catalogued and there's a kind of whale census of these animals every year as they come back from the Caribbean to feed and bring up their young in the uh, rich, fertile waters of, of the Caribbean. But even then, there's still that distance. And for me, that's, that's what draws me on. And these are just some images briefly from, from this past year in Cape Cod where there was an extraordinary explosion a feeding frenzy off the waters of Cape Cod. There was so much fish in the water, bait fish, the fish that the whales and dolphins feed on, that wherever you look, there were just sand eels, which are these tiny, wriggly little animals which swim up from the sand when the sun warms up the water and, and erupt at the surface as though it's raining on, on, on the water. That was You could just see that as far as you could see. And so... So many animals came in. There was common uh, common bottlenose here, which uh, sorry, common dolphin, uh, which this photograph shows. Um, unlike their name, not they're not actually very common. And this was a pod of maybe five or or six common dolphins, which we were seeing constantly um, swimming around the boat, um, doing that playful thing, or the way that we think is playful. Um, you know, the, 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 the sin of anthropomorphy is most, most felt against cetaceans in a way. We project so much human emotion and feeling on these animals. I'd never apologize for that because we have human language. It's the only way we can describe the animals. It's the only way we can relate to them, you know, in our, in our rather pathetic way. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, one of these animals stranded on the beach um, a female, and um, you can see she's she's very she's only been on the beach maybe l less than 24 hours. This is a public town beach, and I went down with a friend of mine who's a scientist to take some biopsies so that possibly the the reasons for her stranding for her death could be could be uh, discovered. And for me, <laughs> rather crazy photograph, but um, for me it was that sense of being very physically close to an animal which you are always very distanced from. And the sense of its shape, which is very like a human, but yet not. It's very sensual. I was able to stroke this animal, to feel the very resistant, hard body, rather like rubber. Those extraordinarily beautifully designed fins and flukes swept back as if by, you know, all her years swimming in the sea. Um, the sense of something which was almost perhaps like we humans might have been if we evolved down the cetacean route. And it also reminded me of an occasion when I went to the London Zoological Society um, a couple of years ago now to attend the dissection of a cetacean. And it was a very strange uh, 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 thing for me to see something like this so exquisite being taken apart. It was on a stainless steel mortuary slab in the laboratories of the Zoological Society of London. Uh, next door is the London Zoo. Uh, the laboratories are semi-underground, but they're open to the zoo at the back, so there's these big doors open to the zoo, so you hear all the lions and monkeys and things going on. As dead animals are being, their comrades are being brought in to be cut open. It's a very strange thing. And this big black plastic, big black plastic bag was hauled out of a 
huge refrigerator on a big chain, like the sort of chain that you haul a car engine out of a pit in. And this bag was slung into the laboratory and onto the, the mortuary table, and the, it was unpeeled. And inside lay a harbour porpoise. A harbour porpoise is one of the smallest cetaceans. It's, it's rather smaller than a, than a dolphin, but again, quite comparable to a human in size and sh not shape, but relationship. And I was very apprehensive because I knew as the surgeon, as it were, um, snapped on his rubber gloves and got his scalpel ready and I knew what was going to happen, that something that I regarded as really beautiful was about to be deconstructed before my eyes. And, of course, with the skill of a sushi chef, he did indeed slice this animal with par. And I sort of resisted the gag in my throat and very quickly realised, as he took the animal apart, you know, every organ that came out made me just more admiring of this animal. It made me feel the kinship between us because every organ was our organ. It could have been me there being biopsied or being necropsied, which is the, the word that you use for an animal, an aut animal autopsy. And the heart and the lungs and even the brain, which he cracked out of the skull and lay there in the, in, in the skull's cups, quivering like a blancmange or a jelly. Um, it made me realize that animal, these animals are actually as beautiful inside as they are without. But it also had another side effect in that as this animal was dissected, we discovered that the entire body cavity was flooded with blood. Every rib had been snapped and the liver had been torn in two. And in fact, this animal was a murder victim. And the murderer you are looking at now it was a dolphin. The harbor, harbor porpoise had been beak-butted to death by a testosterone-fueled young dolphin off the coast of Wales, Cardigan Bay, um, where commonly dolphins will just kill, do kill porpoises for kicks. So it wasn't cute, smiley flipper. It wasn't all these things we imagine about dolphins. It wasn't... It wasn't this kind of imaginary friend that we, we, uh, that, we, that we appear to think dolphins are. And just a couple, this is uh, a fin whale off, off Cape Cod. This is the second biggest animal in the world. It's only slightly smaller than a blue whale. Um, but of course, who would ever tell that from what you see? This torpedo-like torpedo body scything through the water you only ever see maybe 10% of it. It's that that draws you on, the sense of this kind of jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together in your head. You have to imagine what the animal is like. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't display itself fully because of the mantle of the sea. There is always that sense of, of the unknowingness of it. Except when a humpback whale comes right up by the boat, like this one did. And this strange knobby thing, those actual knobs are, are, are actually hair follicles, enlarged hair follicles, which um, possibly test where their prey is in the water. And although it looked as though this animal was kind of showing off to us, in fact, what it was doing was forcing the sand eels towards the boat with its, with its throat and then scooping up to eat them. Now, that's behavior that's learned because of human beings. That's its cultural relationship to us. That's the way it's using us. You know, for centuries we hunted these whales. Well, now these whales are using us to hunt. Again, here in, in Cape Cod, you see them feeding with the gulls eddying round. And a young humpback whale sort of joyously splashing its tail. In fact, we probably think that one of the reasons they use that motion slapping up and down on the sea is, is because they're constipated. But I want to finish talking now with, 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 a, with a, a return to the animal that I started talking about um, because of what it represents to me in, in what I've written about uh, a, 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 and um, really to the story as a whole. 
And this is a photograph of uh, Pico, one of the archipelago of the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, for any of you whose geography is just as bad as mine, the Azores lie equidistant between a sort of point from, drawn from Lisbon to Boston. They're right in the middle of the Atlantic. They're part of the spiny sea mount that runs between Europe and America, like a sort of twisted vertebrae. Um, the Azores are just really erupted volcanoes. They're black, basalt, barbaric, satanic places. They're not holiday places. There's no golden beaches there. It's as though the volcanoes were still spewing out their lava and it was just bubbling and freezing in those chilly Atlantic waters. And indeed, the uh, Azores themselves, the nine islands, are caught on three tectonic plates. They're in the process of being pulled apart themselves, some to America, some to Europe, and some down to Africa. These islands are actually younger than the animals that swim around them. The animals were there before the islands. And the animals, of course, are sperm whales. And sperm whales are very difficult animals to see. They're pelagic animals. They live in the open, deep ocean. They are supremely engineered to dive. They are the deepest diving of any animal. A sperm whale with that strangely counterintuitive square head, that great square head, which is in fact full of spermaceti oil, which when it was first pierced by the early hunters, spurted out, and the hunters thought it was the whale semen, hence the name sperm whale, one of the ugliest names for a beautiful animal I, I know of. But when a sperm whale gets ready to dive, that great square head draws in to a wonderful sort of wedge shape. Its flippers, its pectoral flippers, fit into its wrinkly sides like an aircraft's undercarriage. Every organ in its body shuts down, except for the brain and the heart. The ribs are hinged by a special kind of mucus to close shut, like a concertina. And the lungs decompress, they just collapse. The whale is in the process of charging its body with oxygen. Its blood becomes the repository of its life force, as it will, as you, if, if you will. And then it dives, not like a humpback whale, not like any of those whales, like at an angle. A, humpback, a sperm whale dives directly down, imperially, majestically. And as huge as it is, and they get to be 30 meters long, no, sorry, about 20 meters long, um, it leaves nothing behind, no whirling vortex that you might expect when a sort of something that big descends into the ocean. It's so well designed that all it leaves behind is a calm patch, a calm circular patch of water, which the Inuit call koala. It's the, to them, it's the mirror into the whale's world and the whale's mirror into our world. And these whales descend for up to a mile in depth. They can spend two, maybe three hours down there in the deepest, darkest waters, far from the sun, far from human observation. We still, in the year 2015, don't know what they're doing down there. They could be doing anything. <laughs> we know that they're feeding because in the old days when whales were brought up and killed, um, their stomachs were found to be full of squid. 90% of a squid's, of sperm whale's diet is squid. Um, I met a scientist who discovered 18,000 squid beaks in one sperm whale's stomach. They're greedy creatures. They actually consume more biomass than human beings. Don't tell anyone that. <laughs> Don't tell any fishermen, especially. But they are extraordinary animals. They are physically shapeshifters. Those animals that history has failed to diagnose throughout all of his, whatever science we have applied to it, whatever myth we've applied to it, they do completely astound and confound our observations. So for that reason, I had to see them. And the best place to go in Europe to see sperm whales, well, almost Europe, are the Azores. And I went there with the BBC crew. We were filming, a, a making a film about the, 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 the story behind Moby Dick. And I remember arriving on these islands and feeling so incredibly 
isolated because you are just right in the middle of the Atlantic. You know, you've got waves from Europe and waves from America, from the Antarctic and from the Arctic. You know, those are the only things that north and south that are the poles. That's the only thing that stands between you and the poles. The sense of all that volume of water rushing against these tiny little islands, uh, which are still volcanically active, you know, still restive places. That sense of disturbance. The first night when I slept in my room, I was just completely discombobulated. I just I couldn't deal with it because you could hear the sound, the water on the rocks, because it's not like sandy shores where the water is dissipated. These are slapping rocks. And you only need to go 100 yards out from the shore of the island of Pico, which is this photograph here, um, 100 yards out, and the water falls to a half a mile in depth. You go a half a mile out, the water falls to three miles, a mile and a half out to five miles, incredibly deep, profound waters. This is the home for sperm whales. And on the day that this photograph was taken, we left Lajas do Pico, which is the old whaling town, because the Azores were still whaling until 1986. I was going to nightclubs in London while young men my age were setting off from this island in fragile, clinker-built, double-proud canoas boats built exactly in the same way as were used in Moby Dick times to hunt these whales, to kill these whales. The only difference being that they were towed out by a motorboat. Well, when Portugal joined the EU, whaling stopped in the Azores, but that motorboat still occasionally goes out once or twice a month. When it goes out, the whales disappear. They remember the sound. So we set out on a small, rigid, inflatable boat, a, a Zodiac, fast boat with a, a young Azorian captain and his first mate, very experienced uh, 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 young uh, captain. And as we left the harbour, within maybe 10, 15 minutes of leaving the harbour, a pod of common dolphin came and started riding the bow wave of the boat. Um, it seems joyful. It certainly looks joyful. They're actually riding the compression wave that is created by, by the prow of the boat. I mean, and, and they're, they're clearly having fun, but there's also a sense of competition there that a, one male will come and push another male out of the way and uh, assert his ascendancy. This photograph I took that day from the prow of the boat. I wasn't in the water. This is a photograph underwater. This is from the prow of the boat. I could have reached down and touched that animal. It was so clear. It was extraordinary. Um, but, of course, I knew I wouldn't, and a uh, dolphin would never allow you to touch it unless it wanted you to touch it. But it seemed as though these, this, these dolphins seemed to be a kind of emissary of, of, of what was to happen. And although, again, I sort of poeticize, dolphins are known to associate with sperm whales. They sometimes hoover up the bits of squid that escape from the sides of a sperm whale's mouth as it returns from its diving missions down in those deep waters. And indeed, just very, very soon after these dolphins appeared, Zhao, our captain, stopped the engines of the boat and said, this is your opportunity. What opportunity? I, I couldn't see anything. There were some logs over there, but apart from that, I couldn't see anything. And then I realized the logs were gently rocking up and down. And occasionally, a great square head at one end would rise up, or the flukes at the other end, and they were clearly sperm whales. I was very excited. There's nothing like seeing sperm whales. They are extremely strange animals. They don't resemble any other animal. They are very strangely shaped. Even the color seems to change. At one point, they'll be ebony black, slick with salt water, or lavender, or brown, or the color of cocoa. They seem to change shape and color under the sun. And these animals, there's probably 12 to 14 of them sitting there, rocking gently back and forth, were socializing. They weren't feeding, they were hanging out. And the captain, Zhao, says, this is your best opportunity. You know, the water's cat's poor calm, the whales are chilled out, get in the water. So, a boy who has been scared of getting in the bath 
is suddenly plunged into the Atlantic three miles deep. I didn't even have time to put my wetsuit on, jam my mask on, my snorkel and my fins, and I start going to vaguely in the direction of the whales. <laughs> the camerawoman who's supposed to film the whales gets in the water and has a panic attack because she feels as though this camera, which is meant to have negative buoyancy and is about the size of half a vacuum cleaner and is attached to her wrist by a lanyard, she feels as the camera is sinking down and she with it. And so the producer very quickly drags her out, uh, having a vested interest, because it's his wife, <laughs> um, pulls her out and the director and the director says to me, OK, Philip, we can't do this. Come back, come back. I've waited all my life to do this. <laughs> Just because it can't be filmed, I'm not going to stop. So I carry on swimming. My mistake number one is that wonderful, lucid, crystal clear water, which looks so inviting from above, looking down, when you're looking through it laterally, the visibility is incredibly reduced by these phytoplankton and zooplankton all floating about like asteroids in front of your face. It's a wonderful, dreamy, trippy experience, but it's dangerous because you can't see what's in front of you. So I'm 20 foot away from the whales before I actually see them. Suddenly, my vision is wall-to-wall -wall whale. That's all I can see. <laughs> whale flesh, gray, lumbering, beautiful, extraordinary animals, but definitely scary. These are the biggest predator on the planet. These aren't like humpback whales or blue whales. They don't feed on krill. <laughs> they don't feed on things like that. They feed on bigger things. <laughs> At that point, I'm starting to think this is not a good idea. The largest of the whales, who in retrospect I realize is the matriarch of the group, these animals are entirely matriarchal detaches herself from the pod and starts swimming towards me. And I remember very well that the sperm whale is the only whale that can and indeed has swallowed a human being. And it's not a nice way to go because human beings back in the old days of whaling who were retrieved from whales after they'd been hunted were bleached white by gastric juices so strong that they turned human beings into white slugs. So all this is going through my head as the whale is coming closer and closer. I'm thinking, OK, it's either going to ram into me with that great square pugnacious head, or it's going to open its mouth at the last moment, and that's the end of my literary career. <laughs> Probably quite a good end to a literary career, actually. But, um, but um, uh, And at that point, I lose control of my bodily functions. Probably the first time since I was a little boy, and I think, Jesus, if you piss in the water when sharks are around, that's meant to get them really irate. Um, and then I think, how rude to come visiting and <laughs> do that on someone's doorstep. <laughs> and the whale now is so close, I could easily touch it. I could have easily reached out and touched it. But that wasn't part of the encounter. And after all, generally, you don't poke people the first time you meet them, do you? Um, she turned on her side, and she was right next to me, and she looked at me with an eye the size of a grapefruit, kind of visibly small in comparison to the size of the animal and the way that an elephant's eye is visibly small. But it was utter sentience. It was utter knowingness. It was utter curiosity. Yeah, I will... I, I can never deny that. And I started to feel, I didn't hear, I felt <coughs> through my skull, <coughs> through my sternum, <coughs> through the whole of my skeletal structure, the whale's echolocation, which it used down there in the darkness to find its food, or used to talk to its fellow whales, moving through me like a, an MRI scan, and I've been in an MRI scan, it's a very similar process, creating a three-dimensional sound picture of me, which is being beamed back to its head. I feel that. I feel the, the, the meanness of me being generated in this sound image back in her head. 
and it was the most extraordinary moment in my life. And she dove. She decided, presumably, I was not worthy of eating. Um, and I wasn't going to harm her pack. And she dove. And she dove from this incredible, intense Eve Klein blue right down into the black. And as she dove, the shape she threw was so ludicrously whalish that I laughed to myself. It felt like a CGI creation of a whale. It felt like all the whales that had ever swum through my head come to life here. And yet, it was silent. It was silent. And the silence seemed to completely disassociate me from the reality of it. It was totally dreamlike. And she just disappeared into the profound, velvety black below. And I just laughed, really. It was, it was the most astonishing encounter. And that night when we went back to shore, I couldn't sleep. Um, every time I closed my eyes, the whale swam into my head. And it did that for three nights. It still does it quite often. And a friend of mine, a scientist who worked with sperm whales off Sri Lanka um, some time ago, said that a female student of his had a similar encounter with a sperm whale, and she was echolocated by the sperm whale. And she claimed never to have been mentally right there afterwards, which is obviously what's happened to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>